Hi everybody. It is the, what is it, the 6th of September, 2023. I just got a new tripod for this whole endeavor. And I am trying to adjust it on the fly. All right, I think that's better. Um, what am I doing here? Trying to establish myself out here. I, I'm very underprepared for what I normally am doing on a Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and confess that right now. Normally, I get out here on my deck and set myself up and read through my notes and stuff at like 4 so that by the time five o'clock runs around, I am, you know, ready. But I just got out here. It's one of those days. So you're gonna have to bear with me while I format my document so that it's in the right size for me to read from away out here and everything else. Um, I got no news this week. I uh, generally try to think of something somewhat interesting at least to talk about while I'm sitting here. I don't have anything interesting going on. Um, I've been getting buzzed by uh, hummingbirds out here, which is confusing to me because we have a feeder that has been empty for most of the summer. So it's not like they're out here looking for food, like they're used to it or something, and they're gonna buzz my head. They just, just suddenly decided to come back and uh, get belligerent. I mean, I a parting shot, right? They probably were leaving um, pretty soon as the uh, the weather is changing. Sorry, Copper. We'll be all right. Anyway, um, I think I got everything I need. I'm ready. Not ready. I think I'm set up. How's that? I've been warming my water in the car since yesterday. It's nice and warm. I'm I'm very excited that it's only in what is it? It feels like it's in the 80s. Yeah, it's only in the 80s right now. It's lovely. In fact, after we had our rain on the weekend, um, supposedly it was going to get back up to like the hundreds, at least the high nineties by uh, this coming weekend. But from what I saw, it's not doing that. It's going to be cooling off, which is September. I love it. Well, I was in the store with uh, one of my kids this morning and he was asking why they are selling Halloween Oreos already. Which I thought was funny. You know, to get every year the the holidays creep up a little bit more and more. And so now we have Halloween at the beginning of September. Alright, well, I have rambled enough for five o'clock to come around. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we have a time, a place set apart for us to look into your word. So Lord, I pray that as we um, dedicate ourselves to, to learning from you, from your word, and uh, Lord, I pray that you would be our teacher. I pray that you would uh, lead your people into understanding what your word has to say to us, Lord. And I pray that you would be, uh, that you would give us open hearts, open minds, open eyes to see ourselves, to see what your your word wants to point out to us today and how we can live it out um, with our friends, with our family, with our enemies, to all the people around us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're in Acts chapter 9, the second half of Acts chapter 9. Um, last week we read about 
uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which is one of those, you know, peaks of Acts, uh, the Bible in general, because of all of the, I mean, enduring impact of Saul of Tarsus's life as he became Paul and wrote the New Testament for us and um, went on to evangelize much of the Western world and changed everything. So um, he was, of course, a persecutor of the church who ended up um, blinded by the light and uh, eventually became persecuted because of his, uh, his own faith in the gospel. So um, that's kind of how he ended as he was being chased out of Damascus. But um, it's interesting when you read other parts of the New Testament, Paul tells his own story. And um, if you read Galatians, especially Galatians chapter one, uh, gives us some information about that time in Damascus or outside of Damascus, as it turns out, uh, that Acts sort of just glossed over. So uh, Galatians chapter one, starting in verse 15, it says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among, among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, which is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. So if you're just reading Acts, uh, there's a gap in the narrative there because it never talks about this time that uh, Saul, I'm going to keep calling him Saul until he starts referring to himself as Paul. Saul uh, went away from Damascus into Arabia and he didn't immediately go down to Jerusalem. It, it, where we pick up in Acts chapter 9, um, it seems like he goes immediately from Damascus to Jerusalem, but that's not what he says in Galatia, uh, Galatians. So, there's a three-year gap, which kind of makes sense, you know, because his old life as the persecutor of the church, the chief persecutor of the church uh, that he had in Jerusalem, I mean, that was his whole thing. Uh, that was gone, and he couldn't just walk back in and go to the religious authorities and say, hey, guys, I don't uh, uh, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, that that would have been... A lot of trouble for him so he doesn't go back to Jerusalem he wanders off instead um, and so eventually he went back to Damascus and then felt compelled that he just should go down to Jerusalem at least to meet the uh, the Apostles so Acts chapter 9 uh, picking up in verse 36 and when he had come to Jerusalem he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. But he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, uh, but they were seeking to kill him. And when, his when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So when Saul eventually get down, did get down to Jerusalem, it's no surprise that he would have a hard time joining the disciples. Um, it's the same trouble that he had in Damascus. When, when he went to Damascus, he was lying in bed for those three days. Uh, it took you all right there buddy sorry sounds like my dog's about to attack somebody in my yard but it's just us sorry everything's okay um he gets that way about birds he's probably seeing a bird flying around uh, when he was lying in bed for those three days blind fasting waiting on the Lord, 
uh, it took the personal assurance and um, command of Jesus to get any of the disciples in Damascus to actually go and see um, Saul. And so now he's in Jerusalem, and it's hard to imagine that there's anybody in Jerusalem, a Christian, who did not have their life drastically impacted by Saul's previous work, right? He talked about um, kicking down doors and dragging believers away. Uh, that was his thing, right? And so even though three years have passed, everybody has a story about when Saul, the persecutor, dragged away their mom or their dad or them and threw them in jail. So it's been three years where they didn't hear anything more about Saul of Tarsus. There's probably some rumors that came back from other Christians in Damascus about what had happened to Saul, but it wasn't enough to make them feel comfortable. Yeah, this is great. Let's welcome this guy back into the church. So Barnabas is the bridge builder. Uh, his name translates to uh, son of encouragement, which is a name that they gave him because of the way that he lived life, right? And so he builds this bridge the same way that, that Ananias in Damascus had to go and get Paul. And after he was healed and baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, he brought him to the church so that he could be integrated into the body of Christ. And so this is the same thing that happens again now in Jerusalem. And, and it's Barnabas who gets to be this guy. We first met Barnabas back in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we saw that he sold a large piece of property and he brought that uh, the price of that sale to the disciples and laid it at their feet so that it could be used to feed the needy in the church. Um, so it was this that it was that gift that inspired Ananias and Sapphira to, to sort of copycat his gift and try to pretend like they were making the same sort of gift. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate, I guess, that, that their insincerity and the punishment that they suffered because of their insincerity overshadowed the gift that Barnabas brought and the good work that he did. But as we get to know Barnabas, I think that he wasn't bothered by being overshadowed. I, I don't think he was a guy that cared about that sort of recognition. I don't think he wanted it. I don't think that's why he did anything. I think he was just a guy who really loved the Lord and wanted his people, God's people, to be cared for and encouraged. And that's why they gave him the name son of encouragement so he doesn't care about the fanfare he just gave to the church because he loved the church and now he is coming and showing love to Saul who was formerly an enemy um, because he wanted to show love to the body of Christ still and he wanted Saul of Tarsus to be able to take his place in the body of Christ in Jerusalem so again we learn from Galatians as we read just a minute ago that Saul only lasted for 15 days in Jerusalem two weeks uh, before he had made enough enemies that he had to run away again um, it's the Hellenists which was the same group that inspired the uh, arrest or sparked off the, the arrest and eventual uh, murder of Stephen right it was the Hellenists that and so uh, you can imagine as Paul had once been their yeah, figurehead, at very least, of the persecution that began with Stephen. Now he is debating against them and the humiliation of that, that they couldn't uh, win him back over, uh, that their guy was now their chief critic. Uh, preaching the gospel publicly, that would have been very embarrassing for them, very damaging to their whole cause. And so they're seeking to kill him. And uh, 
the believers in the church just decide, hey, you know what, let's just get Paul, let's get Saul, I'm sorry, out of town, and they send him back to his hometown of Tarsus. And he disappears from the Acts narrative for a while now. Um, but it's interesting that now that he is out of the picture as a persecutor, it says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and it multiplied. Um, blessed subtraction of Saul of Tarsus from the, uh, the life of the church for a little while. Uh, verse 32. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. So Peter kind of returns to the spotlight. Um, he was the main character of Acts, the focal point of Acts, I guess, for the first kind of three or four chapters, and then we learned about the deacons for a little while, and then we got a bit of Paul's life, his conversion a little bit, and then it's going to come back to Peter for a little while longer. Um, and so we learned that his practice at this point in the life of the church was to travel around and visit the different groups of believers who were in and around um, the larger area now. And um, as part of his sort of circuit, and this is a direct result of the persecution, by the way, because before they were all together, it talked about them being all together in Jerusalem for um, the first beginning, infant stages of the life of the church. They were all in one place, and so he didn't need to travel around and go and visit people, but now um, the persecution spread people out, and it's going to continue to spread people out further. Um, and so now Peter's people, the, the flock that he's supposed to shepherd, are not all gathered in one place, but they're around. And so he goes around also. Um, man, weird goings on in my row. What are those people doing? My dog's barking at him now, so that's good. Um, so as part of his circuit, sorry, I'm distracted by the things going around in my neighborhood right now. Hummingbirds, people on the road, loose dogs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, as he's going around a circuit, he meets this man, Aeneas, who has been uh, paralyzed for eight years. And as another sort of side note, um, this is the kind of thing that the deacons were made for. The reason that the deacons were created were so that the apostles could focus on this sort of work and they wouldn't be tied down to taking care of the practical everyday needs of the church. It's not that those things were unimportant. It's not that those things were, um, you know, too mundane for the likes of exciting people like Peter, but God had different things for them. And if Peter had been doing you know, food ministry, he would not be able to travel around and encourage the saints and meet a guy like Aeneas. Now, it's interesting to me <clears throat> that there's no sort of preamble to this discussion with uh, Aeneas. Uh, we don't know if Aeneas was saved already. We don't know if Peter and Aeneas knew each other from before. Um, but, you know, I wonder about things like that a lot, but obviously Luke did not consider that part of the whole of the whole story important, and so he just left it out because that's not a need to know thing. It doesn't matter. What matters is that Peter saw him. He had been paralyzed for eight years, and he said, "Hey, Jesus Christ heals you, Aeneas." And then he said, "Hey, make your bed." And if you've been laying in your bed for eight years, and you have now an opportunity to 
restart your life, making your bed is a pretty good place. So Aeneas got up. Everyone around him turned to the Lord as a result of this miracle. You know, it was probably pretty small villages, uh, Lydda and Sharon. Um, so one of those sort of neighborhoods where everybody knew each other. And so it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a deniable miracle, right? Nobody could say, nah, you're just imagining things, or I've never heard of him before. What do you, how can I know that this was really a thing that happened? Everybody knew him, and it was a powerful testimony for the truth of the gospel. And so everybody turned to the Lord. Verse 36. Now, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translates, uh, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. Now, uh, it's unfortunate to me that uh, the name Dorcas sort of overshadows this story. I guess we're talking about overshadowing a lot tonight. Uh, even in my Bible, at the heading of this section, it says, Dorcas re restored to life. And it's funny to me because they chose that. They call her Tabitha just as many times as they call her Dorcas, but everybody knows her as Dorcas, and they decided that was going to be the heading they were going to put at the top of this section of my Bible. For what it's worth, both of those names mean gazelle, which again, you know, if your name means gazelle, but you're called Dorcas, that's going to overshadow <laughs> your life. Um, anyway, she's from another town, Joppa. And uh, there was a community of Christians there. She was a beloved member who took care of the, uh, the rest of the church. And, um, you know, it's, it's, kind of interesting that she had such a good reputation of taking care of the practical needs of a small group of people you know not a exciting Billy Graham preacher not a uh, showy famous actress or anything like that just a humble loving caring member of of her small community of little villages and that was what earned her a place in the Bible of just taking care of business on the small scale. You don't have to be, you know, some huge mega famous influencer of millions of people. You just have to work with the circle of influence that God gives you, not looking to make it bigger not you know praying for church growth for the sake of growth but just doing what is here in front of you and so uh, good woman and when her when uh, she died the disciples desperately sent to peter hey come here and i don't know what they really expected from peter it doesn't say if they were coming because they hoped that he was going to perform a miracle or if they just wanted the comfort of having Pastor Peter to explain things to them, give them a, a sense of order and right and wrong. Um, you know, when somebody close to you dies, it can seem like, where was God for all of this? Where's the, the reason in this? It's chaos. And especially in those days, when... They're the first generation of believers. And, you know, you read some of the, the letters of Paul to uh, different churches, and they were confused. You know, I thought Jesus was coming back, and yet people are starting to die. Do they get to go to heaven too? Or is it only when, you know, the people who are raptured that get to go to heaven? So they may have been calling for Peter just to explain things to them. Or maybe they really did expect him to to perform a miracle. Either way, verse 39. So, Peter rose and went went with them, 
the two men who would come from Joppa. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows stood, all the widows, not windows, all the widows uh, stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So Peter's healings of first Aeneas and then Tabitha are very reminiscent of miracles that Jesus himself performed here on earth. And the descriptions of the way that he healed these people, they very much recall the way that Jesus healed people when he was uh, training Peter. And so as a apostle and disciple of Jesus, Peter had seen all of these things take place. And so he acts in much the way that Jesus did, right? And I think that the way that Luke records these things and, you know, I think we see it maybe even more clearly than other times that I've read the book of Acts, that because we just finished the book of Luke, right? The gospel of Luke. I think that the way Luke records all of these miracles taking place and the description he gives them, uh, he did that in intentionally to call back the miracles of Jesus and to show the continuity between Jesus and his disciples. Uh, Jesus' ministry on earth didn't end because he died. Uh, he, it, it continued as he used his people, and that's why Acts starts out the way that it does in Acts 1, verse 1, where it says, In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so, of course... Luke was the, the book that he wrote that was um, about Jesus beginning to do and teach. And now we get this continuity between Peter and Jesus that shows that, that, Peter, that Jesus is still acting through Peter. And the continuity is ongoing. right? The same Holy Spirit that used Peter to do these miracles is the same Holy Spirit that fills me and fills you and fills the people in the church down the street. That Peter should act in the same way as Jesus is, you know, expected. It's almost like, you know, it's only natural. He saw all of these things taking place. Um, but later on, we're going to see other people take up the same mantle, do the same sorts of miracles that Jesus did that Peter did and like for example Paul you know Paul didn't get to follow Jesus around in the desert of Israel for three years he didn't get to witness all of those miracles firsthand although hey listen I bet he saw a lot I bet he did because it's not like he just was born the day that he had Stephen executed you know he was around he was a he was a Jew who lived in Jerusalem, even though he was from Tarsus. So, um, Paul takes up the same sort of miracles and performs the same sort of miracles that Peter did, that Jesus did also. And um, later on, some of the men who traveled with, with, with Paul do the same sorts of miracles. And so, um, we also saw Philip, who was a, a deacon. He uh, healed, he taught, he established a church of new believers, just like the disciples had done in Jerusalem. And so, what I'm circling back to again is that the acts of Jesus didn't cease with his death. And they didn't cease with the twelve apostles either. Jesus is still working today. He's working through us um, all the time, every day. And I, I think when we consider that as a fact, when we think, yes, the Holy Spirit who inhabited 
Paul the Apostle inhabits me also. The, the Holy Spirit who used Peter to raise up Tabitha, he is the same Holy Spirit who enables me to do everything that I'm supposed to do for him as well. And I think when we consider all of that, we tend to ask the wrong question. And I think the question that we usually ask is, why doesn't he use me to do miracles also? Why don't I get to ever raise somebody up from the dead? How come if the Holy Spirit is filling me and giving me gifts, he doesn't give me those kind of gifts? Why not? And that's a very understandable question. That's a very common one that I've heard a lot from uh, not only high schoolers, but, you know, adults, people that were um, missionaries and were out there planting churches with me and asking me the same sorts of questions, you know, not, not that I was a uh, any kind of leader of my group, but um, I remember having conversations with guys my own age and were out there doing the work of planting a church, starting a church from scratch, and they asked me, how, how come God doesn't give us those kinds of ends, right? That's such an easy in. If we could heal somebody, if we could um, raise somebody from the dead, it would be so easy to establish a church here. Um, and, you know, as we have looked through Acts, we've kind of addressed the question of how come we don't see those things anymore? Not necessarily to satisfaction, but we've we've looked at that. How come the things that we see there we don't see that nowadays. But instead, I think the better question, the one that we should be asking when we think about the Holy Spirit using Peter and Paul and using me, I think the question that we should be asking is not how come he doesn't give me miraculous gifts, but how come I'm not using the gifts that God has given me to work already? He's already given me gifts. He's already given you gifts. How come we're not using them more? And maybe that's one of those sort of uh, presumptuous questions that preachers ask. Like, I'm already assuming that you're not using the gifts that God has given you. Um, and, you know, this is in video format. It's going to go out. I have no control over who watches it. Um, I have no idea who you are or, I mean, the people who are watching now, I pretty much know who you are. But the people who watch later on, I don't know, and I don't know what God is doing in you or, or how he has gifted you, but I know that he wants us to be faithful in what he has given us. Not looking for, how come I don't have something more exciting? Not looking for, I want to be uh, more well-known, but just faithful like Tabitha, who had the gift of loving her little community and I mean, the people who were weeping around her were, were holding the clothes that she had made for them because she loved them so much. And that was such a big impact on the tiny little community of Joppa that it made it into the Bible. More than some of the other figures that, that I'm sure throughout the, church, the history of the church, people who raised from the dead, people who performed miracles of, hearing, of, of healing, and it happened off screen of the Bible. It wasn't a thing that made it in, but here's, she's not only named, but she's named twice as this incredible woman who, in her own humble way, changed the world, changed how we think about living for Jesus because of the just constant faithfulness in the little things that God gave her. And so, anyway, Peter raises her from the dead. And uh, what's interesting to me is that he does it differently than he did with Aeneas, even though, you know, it was chronologically very close. Uh, it was physically very close. He was able to walk from one place to the other in a very short time. Um, Aeneas, it was pretty public and he said hey Aeneas Jesus heals you and with uh, Tabitha he does it privately he sends everybody out of the room um, 
and then he raises her up and then calls people back in. Um, anyway, it's interesting that, that God doesn't always do things the same way, right? We saw this with Jesus. Uh, if you read through the Gospels, there are at least four or five times where it describes the process of Jesus uh, healing a man who was blind. And no two ways are the same. Uh, he, he does things that we don't expect. He does things in ways that we don't expect. And this continues. And so, um, because of all the things that were going on in Lydda and in Joppa, Peter determines, hey, I'm just going to stick around for a while. Things are popping off around here. The communities of these two villages are, everybody's coming to the gospel. Um, I'm going to stick around. And so, I like that. I like that he was able to just say, hey, you know what? Jerusalem is okay. You guys have 11 other apostles. You don't need me to remain here. Um, I'm just going to go and hang out with this little village. Um, and if you remember, again, in the Gospels, there's a, an occasion where um, Jesus is up all night healing uh, a big community. Everyone's excited. And then he wanders off in the in the early morning before anyone else is awake to go pray and everyone's looking for him and when when peter finally finds him um he says hey we've been looking for you meaning hey we want you to continue doing the things that you've been doing before this community this little village um there's a lot of things going on it's exciting let's get back to it and jesus says no but i'm gonna go to all the other little villages and towns because that's where i've been called uh he doesn't want to just stay in one place and so here's peter leaving jerusalem to go and remain in these nowhere little villages because that's where god put them and so um i don't know i just like all the little things that we see in this chapter it's not the uh big exciting paul conversion of early chapter nine but it's the more quiet humble faithfulness of little things of the end of chapter nine it's interesting to see those things contrasted and know that uh god's in both of them right god is is uses all things for his uh for the good of his people and sometimes it's big and flashy and exciting and it's going to knock you off your horse and other times it's just quietly faithfully taking care of hey that woman doesn't have a coat i'm going to weave her one and give it to her and God uses those things too. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for all of the different ways that you use your people, all the different ways that you reach your people, all the different ways that you take care of your people. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be uh, walking around with our eyes open, that we would be expecting you to do things that we don't expect, that we would be looking for you to work in different ways that maybe we've never seen you work before. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful, help us to be uh, open to being used by you in ways that we don't expect as well. We're, we're your people. We want to be uh, your hands and feet to, to spread your gospel to, to our communities, to our friends and family. And we want you to use us, please. In Jesus' name. All right, guys, thanks for uh, joining me. I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll see you here next Wednesday. God bless you.